Well, those truths are worth singing about, whether you're on your couch at home or in these church pews right around here. I want to thank several people at this juncture. I want to thank our technicians, and especially David Waldo of those technicians. They've done such a fantastic job over these last several months, especially when we were in our online-only segment of this pandemic and everything was pre-recorded and everything had to be turned in and stitched together in sort of this cohesive uh, look. But uh, it may be uh, at least as complicated, if not more, to stitch together combinations of live programming right here in the building and pre-recorded things that have been turned in to make sure and represent the folks who are still worshiping from home. And so thanks so much. We've just got, we've often said it, but we have this embarrassment of riches when it comes not only to the talent of the musicians on the platform, but all those behind the scenes that make uh, all of this possible. So thanks so much for our technicians. I also want to say thanks for our uh, ministry staff and office staff and custodial staff who uh, have done such a fine job pivoting in the last few months to a new uh, way of doing church and a new way of keeping up with people and pe keeping people connected with each other. And a uh, special word of thanks in, on staff to Mike McDonough, who uh, came on as our Minister of Education and Administration a year ago and probably had no idea that this would be what he is responsible for as he hits his first anniversary with us. Uh, some of you are old enough to know the character on MASH called Radar O'Reilly, and uh, Mike McDonough is our Radar O'Reilly. He anticipates our concerns and our needs and knows how to meet them, and we're so grateful for him. And I'm grateful for uh, those of you who are coming back to the building now that our building has opened up again. And I know it feels a little bit weird. You have to come in and sit so spread apart, and uh, there are no bulletins or other materials to hand out, and you're needing to wear a mask and, and all of that. It feels a little bit odd, but I'm so glad that you've come in to be a part of things with us and, and uh, to keep me company as uh, we have an opportunity to study God's Word together in this setting. And of course, I do want to thank uh, those who are worshiping online as well. Those of you who are in the building, you look around the room and you wonder where everybody is. About 90% of your congregation is still doing what all of us were doing for several weeks, and that is they're continuing to worship from home. And one of the reasons we're doing some of the things we do with the pre-recorded segments is to sort of symbolize and, and, uh, and let folks know that if they're still worshiping from home, they're still very much in our uh, thoughts and, and on our mind, and they're still very much a part of this fellowship. You don't have to show up at a building to be part of the fellowship worshiping together. And so keep that in mind if you're in the building is that you have some 300 more people that are watching online. And uh, those of you who are in the building, if you see John when he's up here, or Mike when he's up here, or myself during the sermon, uh, spending uh, more time looking into the camera than we are looking straight into your faces, it's because we are mindful of the fact that we've got about 90% of our gathering that's still worshiping from home even as you're worshiping in this setting. Let's ask God's blessing on all of these changes that we're going through. And by the way, you know, all those words of thanks, you know, usually you hear those words of thanks at the conclusion of some campaign or some project. And we're, uh, this campaign, this project is not concluded. We're going, it's going to be a long time before we're back to whatever we're going to regard as normal in the future. All those things that we were used to and accustomed to doing as a church, uh, the coffee fellowship and the uh, kids' church and the uh, and the and the life groups on campus and all of that. Uh, it's going to be some time before we get a chance to participate in all of that like we were used to. And uh, so I thank you for your prayers, for your support, and for your patience as we continue to learn how to be this kind of church in multiple settings, not only in the building but in houses all around Austin and in fact all around the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Heavenly Father. We are grateful for this chance to worship, whether it be uh, through the online opportunity, whether it be live in this building, we thank you for the chance to worship, not just to worship uh, single and on our own, but to worship as part of the people of God. Help us to have this sense, even if we are scattered out uh, at different points of the building or as we are uh, alone or uh, with our family in our own homes, Help us to just sense that we are part of a wonderful gathering of people whom we know, people whom we love, people uh, uh, to whom we are accountable, people we pray for, 
And we ask, Lord, that you would help us then to be mindful as we worship you as our Father, that we're worshiping you as brothers and sisters in Christ together. Help us to uh, continue to improve as a, as a church, as church leadership, uh, and doing the kinds of things that we need to do to uh, continue to worship, continue to hold each other accountable, to continue to pray for each other and support each other, even as we are in these uncertain days. We pray, Lord, that you would in enable this word that is shared today to be just the word that all of us need to hear at this juncture in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometime back, I read about a convenience store that was having trouble with uh, loitering troublemakers. Most of them were, were teenagers who had nothing to, else to do on into the evenings, and so they would hang around this parking lot of this convenience store. And that would have been fine enough, but they spray-painted graffiti on the sides of the convenience store. They trashed the parking lot. They intimidated customers as customers were trying to come in. And, and uh, so the uh, manager of the convenience store tried a number of things. He put up a no loitering sign. Well, that didn't do anything. He would go out from time to time to try to, try to shoo them away, but they outnumbered him vastly. Uh, and then he finally came up with an idea that worked marvelously. He set up some loudspeakers out in the parking lot and started piping in easy listening music into the parking lot. <laughs> and after three songs in a row of Barry Manilow, the group decided to find somewhere else to loiter around. Now, the reality is that you today have troubling thoughts loitering around your heart. Guilt from things you've done in the past or anxiety about what you think the future might have in store for you or worries about what's going on in your life or your loved one's lives right now. And those things loiter around and hang around and make trouble for you but I want you to know that as you lift up praise to God, as you thank Him for who He is and what He's done for you, those troubling thoughts are going to hang around. Now that's the truth that we find in Psalm 33. And so I'd like you to find your copy of God's Word, Psalm 33. We'll post it up on the screen as well. And you can find it uh, online. Uh, the CDC is telling us that in order to reopen church buildings again, we need to reduce the number of uh, surfaces that people touch, and so we're not handing out bulletins. You probably picked up on that already. We're not handing out bulletins when you come in here. And so we're asking you to bring in your mobile devices. You might remember some of you uh, uh, in youth group when the youth minister told you to put away your mobile devices, but we're encouraging you to bring them, your iPad or your, or, your, or your cell phone or some other mobile device so that you can access this information that is not being handed out to you. All the things that we, that we used to hand out to you in our bulletin are now being provided for you at hillcrest.church slash, get it, bulletin. All right, hillcrest.church slash bulletin. Now, you can ask us later why we decided to call it bulletin, but I'll go ahead and tell you now, it's because all the things that you used to receive when you came in here, you can now find online at hillcrest.church slash bulletin. So you'll find the connection card there. You'll find uh, instructions for giving there. You'll find the order of worship there. You will find uh, you know, upcoming events listed off there, and you will find the sermon notes. And I hope that I've given you enough time to find that page now and find the sermon notes because the sermon notes include Psalm 33 in its entirety in an outlined form. And what I want us to do is begin with the end because the closing three verses of Psalm 33 say this, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now, all of us, I think, would, would say that we want to get to the point where those last three verses perfectly describe us. We wait in hope for you, Lord. How do we get to the point where we can express the confidence of the last three verses of Psalm 33? by looking at the first 19 verses of Psalm 33. As we look at what this poet reflected over, what he celebrated, we can find ourselves moving into that place where we express the kind of hope that is described in the last three verses of Psalm 
33. Now, the first three verses of the psalm issue the call to praise. There's often a call to worship or a prelude, even in our own worship services here. Well, here's the prelude. Here's the call to worship as it's found in Psalm 33, the first three verses. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. That's how verse 1 puts it. Now, why is it fitting to praise God? Well, the rest of the verses in this psalm tell us. The rest of the verses in this psalm give us four reasons why it is fitting, why it is right for us to praise the Lord. So if you have your sermon notes on your mobile device, you can fill in the blanks as we come to them. First of all, consider the Lord's creative word. Consider the Lord's creative word, and you'll find reason to praise God. Take a look at verses 4 through 9. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. This is a word about the word of the Lord. So in this instance, when we're speaking about the Lord's creative word, we're not talking about the Bible, although that certainly is part of it. Uh, but what we're talking about is God's command, God's authority. He spoke and things came into being. Now, this was written at a time when kings had absolute control over their subjects. When a king wanted something done, he only had to command it, and the people who were under him had to follow through with providing it. Now, in this particular psalm, God commanded a marvelous thing. He said, I want stars, and stars came into being. Look at verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry host by the very breath of his mouth. You know, there are an estimated 200 billion billion stars in the universe. There are some that are one billion miles in diameter, which is five, uh, which is uh, which is uh, five thousand times uh, or one thousand times larger than our sun. And then there are stars that are five thousand miles in diameter, which is smaller than our Earth. There are quasars, there are pulsars, there are white dwarfs, there are supernovae, and they all came into being because God said, "I want stars." Now the wonderful thing about this statement, though, is that. As much as God delights in bringing stars into existence, that same power is here to meet our needs as God sees fit. Robert Louis Stevenson, in one of his poems, said, The stars shine over the mountains. The stars shine over the sea. The stars look up to the mighty God. The stars look down on me. The stars shall last for a million years, a million years and a day. But God and I will live in love when the stars have passed away. God is interested in bringing stars into existence, but by that same power, that same word, he speaks, and that which he knows we need is provided. Now, there was a centurion in Jesus' day that recognized that the very same authority, the same power of the spoken word that is mentioned here in Psalm 33 was what he saw when he looked at Jesus, it was a Roman centurion who discovered this. There was that time where he, Jesus was sent for because a, a servant boy in the house of this Roman centurion was deathly ill. And Jesus began to go uh, to this centurion's house, and the centurion stopped and said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Isn't that remarkable? And he goes on to describe why he believed this kind of power resided in Jesus. He said, I'm a man under authority. I'm a man who has authority. I have soldiers under me, and I tell them, do this, and they have to do it. I say, go here, and they have to go. They may not like my authority. They may not share my agenda, but they have to do what I say because I'm the one in control. And this centurion said, I see that, I see that same power in you, Jesus. Just say the word, and that which is... Is, is causing my servant suffering will go away. Now, isn't that remarkable that it was this Roman centurion 
Not somebody who had read the Old Testament along with Jesus' peers, but a Roman centurion who recognized that the same power that we're talking about here in Psalm 33 was resident within Jesus himself. All he had to do was say the word, and that which was needed would be taken care of. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand all this celebration of God's authority and all God has to do is speak and everything that we need will come into existence. I don't want you to think that the writer of Psalm 33 is looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. I mean, you, you've probably read several of the Psalms in the Old Testament. There are 150 of them in the book of Psalms. And a third of the book of Psalms is made up of what are called Psalms of Lament. What that means is they're songs of cries and complaint about the fact that God doesn't seem to be coming through for the poet at that particular time. Now, here's the thing. Both of those songs are in our Bibles because both of those songs need to be in the believer's heart. If you are never lifting up a cry of complaint to God, you're not being honest. But if you are never, or at least rarely, lifting up a song of praise and celebration to the Lord, you're not being trusting. And so both of these psalms are in our Bibles because both of these characters of expression need to be in our heart as a believer. Psalm 33 is in our Bibles so that we might have words of praise to lift up to God. And remember what I said at the beginning of this study. We need to lift those words up uh, to God, not just when things are going well and all's right with the world and things are going smoothly. We need to lift up these songs of praise when things are going poorly and when we have troubled thoughts around our heart because when troubled thoughts loiter around our heart and we lift up songs of praise like this, those troubled thoughts aren't going to hang around much longer. So we need to look at why we should praise God in whom we put our hope. We praise God for his creative word, a God who takes care of our needs in a marvelous way. Here's a second thing. We're told not only to praise God's creative word, but to celebrate the Lord's controlling plan. The Lord's controlling plan. Uh, let's take a look at verses 10 through 12. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Now we're commanded to sing it here. The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. We're commanded to sing it so that we might start the process of reflecting over it and thinking about it. Now I want you to think about all of the Christian life all the elements and qualities and characters of the Christian life that are entirely dependent upon your confidence that the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. Romans chapter 8, verse 39, speaks of God's love. It says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That is only true because the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 is a verse that if you haven't memorized in any verses in a while, you ought to memorize this one. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. That means that God got this salvation work started in your life. He continues on developing you and sanctifying you in the present day until the time that He comes to bring you to Himself and glorify you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So your justification, your sanctification, your future glorification, it's all a work of God. God doesn't get it started and then hand it off to you and say, okay, now it's up to you. He is in charge of this process from beginning to end. But we only know that, that Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 is true because the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. What about the wonderful future that God has in store for us? We studied through the book of Revelation all through the winter and the spring. Revelation 21 verse 3 says that God wins. John said, And I heard a loud voice from the universe's throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's God's intention for our forever future. But that is only true because the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. We celebrate 
this reality so that everything that it is based on becomes clearer and firmer in our hearts and in our minds. You praise God for the confidence you have and the plans he has for you. And you're going to find troubling thoughts scattering away from your heart instead of loitering around causing trouble. Here's another thing to write down. Not only the, creatives, uh, the Lord's creative word and his controlling plans, but verses 13 through 15 tell us to worship the Lord's discerning watch care. The Lord's discerning watch care. Let's look at verses 13 through 15. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. And notice the descending order of God's power here. He's speaking about the cosmos in point one, right? About God speaking stars into existence. And then he moves from the cosmos to human history within the cosmos. God's controlling plans over all the circumstances and events of this world. And then he moves from the cosmos to human history down to individuals within human history as he speaks here about what God is doing. Verse 14 says, from his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. Now that is a source of great comfort or it's a source of great conviction. It just depends on whether you are in trouble or making trouble. And if you are making trouble, you don't want this to be true, right? You don't, you don't want to know that God watches everything that's going on. But when you are in trouble, you can be grateful that God watches all that is going on. And, and so we need to trust this. We need to know this is real. We need to believe this is a fact. And as we do that, as we praise God, as we reflect over this in his presence, that which troubles the thoughts of our heart, scatter away. And then there's one more point I want you to write down. The Lord's unfailing might. The Lord's unfailing might is a reason to praise God. And when we praise God for his unfailing might, along with these other things as well, our hope in him is restored. Let's look at verses 16 through 19 that speak of his unfailing might. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance despite all its great strength that cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Now, I mentioned that Psalm 33 is kind of like this funnel that moves from the greatest down to the most specific. So it starts out speaking about the cosmos and God saying, I want stars and stars came into existence and then it moves from the cosmos to human history as we speak about God's controlling plan over all the events and all the circumstances of this world. And then it moves down into individuals within human history that God is watching the great and the small. He's watching the wicked and the righteous. And now it moves into its most specific point of the funnel of all. God's eyes are not just on all of humans within human history and the cosmos. God's eyes are on you and on me as we focus our hope and attention and trust in him. Now, in these verses, the poet cautions us against relying completely and totally upon things that human beings promise us. But now, we should not assume that what the Bible is saying is we need to get rid of all these things that human beings trust in. It's a good thing to have insurance policies. It's a good thing to have a strong military. It's a good thing to have police and firemen and first responders. It's a, it's a good thing to be able to have people we can count on. But what the poet is telling us is don't put your ultimate trust, don't lean ultimately and finally upon all of these things. What the poet is letting us know is that it's through these things or in spite of the weaknesses of these things that God is going to take care of those who are his own. In the last, uh, you know, yesterday, I, I had a chance to gather together with uh, brothers from two churches, actually three churches, and we gathered at Fairview Baptist Church in South Austin. Gilbert Chavez is the pastor there, and he's working to reach out into a predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly Hispanic community, and they needed some work done on this older building, tear out some things so they could get ready for some renovations, and so... Uh, several of us from two churches joined some from that church, and we 
had a lot of really dusty, gritty, grimy work yesterday. And you don't like to sing wearing a mask in here. We were, we were working hard, breathing our own carbon dioxide for, for about four or five hours. It was work. And, uh, but I remember during a break, I talked with Pastor Gilbert about some of the things going on at the church and whether they were back in, in the building as, as, as we're back in the building. And, and he talked about the fact, uh, uh, as us pastors do, you know what you're preaching through right now. And he, he's getting ready, as of today, to start preaching through the book of Ecclesiastes. And some of you would think, wow, that's a depressing book in the middle of the summer to preach through. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. But really, the point of the book of Ecclesiastes is what we're looking at here, this section of Psalm 33. Because the point of the book of Ecclesiastes is you never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. The book of Ecclesiastes is all about somebody who pursued all the grandest things, all the glorious things. He reached the height of what we would regard as success and wealth and prominence. And it didn't satisfy him. It didn't fulfill him at all. He was trusting in these things to bring him worth and satisfaction and security. And it didn't bring him worth and satisfaction and security. And so he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes to warn us about pursuing the same routes he had been pursuing and end up as disappointed and deeply disturbed as he was disappointed and deeply disturbed. And, and so really, the book of Ecclesiastes can be found in just these few verses here in Psalm 33. I think we need to discover the truth of the book of Ecclesiastes. I think we need to discover the truth of these few verses in Psalm 33, where the poet says the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. And as we trust in him, as we lean on him and him exclusively, we see, we see to it that he takes care of us far more competently and far more worthy way than any of these other human things that we could be leaning on or relying on. So Psalm 33 gives us four things to celebrate. And as we celebrate these things, we find ourselves with our hope restored. And as we find ourselves with our hope restored, those troubling thoughts that disturb our minds and our hearts can't abide those praise songs, and they scatter as we're more and more confident in the Lord. Now, here's what I want to do. I, I want us to put those four points back up on the screen again, and I want you to choose one to praise God for today. You look at these and you go, I can't just choose one, but right now there's at least the one of these that you're especially glad is in your arsenal of, of things to praise God for. And I want you to choose one of those. And so in just a, just a moment, those of you who are in this building, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as I get to each one of these points. Is, and you're going to, by raising your hand, indicate this is the one that I'm really glad is mine and the Lord. Those of you who are at home, you can write it out on Facebook Live, or you can uh, say it to somebody who's in the same room with you, or you can text it to somebody that you know is watching this service along with you. But let's just look at these and be ready to choose which one you're going to choose. So the poet tells us here in Psalm 33 to praise the Lord for his creative word. My needs will be met as God commands my needs to be met. Psalm 33 tells us to praise the Lord for his controlling plan because he is in control of everything. All his promises are going to be fulfilled to me. And Psalm 33 tells us to praise the Lord for his discerning watch care. He sees all that's going on. And we can be really grateful for that, especially when we are in trouble and not making trouble. And so we maybe that's what you're grateful for right now, that, that the Lord didn't put you on a shelf and abandon you. He knows exactly what's going on in your life right now. Or maybe what you want to do is praise the Lord for his unfailing might. We need to base our security on him instead of on other things that could prove so unworthy of our trust. So which one is it? Let's look at it again. Those of you who say the Lord's creative word, text that now or raise your hand in the building. That's the reason you're praising God today. Amen. How about that second one? The Lord's controlling plan. You are so grateful that God knows what he's doing. He's in charge. And because of that, his promises for you are sure. A lot of people in the building are raising their hand for that. Those of you who are online at home, text that to somebody or write it on Facebook Live if you're watching there. How about the Lord's discerning watch care? To know that God is watching out for you and looking out for you. Amen to that. And how about God's might, God's authority, God's control? You're grateful for that. Text that or, or write that on Facebook Live or raise your hand in the room for that. And so we return 
to the verses we started with. We started with the end of Psalm 33, the last three verses. And this is where the poet is trying to get us to by all the things that he said in the first 19 verses. After you've reveled in joy over God's creative word and after you've lost yourself in wonder over God's controlling plan and after you've celebrated God's discerning watch care and after you've been caught up in God's unfailing might, then you'll find yourself in the same place that the poet found himself in verses 20 through 22. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now some listening to this message today have not yet, for the first time, placed their hope and trust in the work of Jesus Christ. Now, as you've picked up today from our study of Psalm 33, even those of us who go to church and we sing the songs and we read the Bible, we're a work in progress. We still have to return back to that place where we remember to trust God. We have to return back to that place where we remember to hope in Him. And that trust and that hope needs to mature over the years. But it's got to start somewhere. It's got to start sometime. And for some of you, right here, right now, is the time for you to start your trust in the Lord. I quoted uh, Romans chapter 8 earlier, another verse. Here's another verse from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave himself for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? See what that verse is telling us? That verse is telling us that if we first place our trust in what God did for us in Jesus on the cross, all of this that we've been talking about today starts lining up behind that. And so maybe it's here and it's now that you need to ask Jesus to come into your life for the first time and begin this lifelong process that the rest of us are on of trusting God better, hoping in Him better. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I want to pray for those who are believers and then I want to pray for those who need to become believers. For those of us who are believers, this is the kind of prayer we need to lift up to the Lord. Lord, help me get to the place that this poet eventually got to in the closing verses of Psalm 33. Help me get to the place where I trust you more, where I hope in you better. Help me to think through these reasons the poet gave for why he hoped in the Lord so that I can reflect on those reasons and hope in you in a better way. Lord, I've got to admit that around my heart are loitering, troublesome thoughts. Help me to send them scattering away, not just by telling them to go away, by wishing they would go away, but by just focusing my attention on you. And then as I look back around my life, I'll see those things have gone away because I trusted in you, I praised you, I thanked you. Help me to remember this, this formula, this process for causing troubling thoughts to leave. But Lord, is pastor, I also want to pray right now for those who have not yet, for the first time, placed their hope and trust in you. And I pray that they will see that the work of the cross is the perfect place to start trusting you. Help them to see, Lord, that what you did for us in Jesus on the cross should make any doubts, any fears, any hesitations about who you are and what you want for my life for it to go away. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, uh, to help those who need to come and to trust in you to see that it starts at the cross. And I pray that you would speak into their hearts so in return they would speak from their heart to you, something like this. Dear Jesus, come into my life and be my Savior, be my Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sin. Take it away now. Give me a clean new heart inside. And help me to trust that you who did the greatest thing for me taking away my sin by the death of the Son will, will take care of all the lesser things in my life that I worry about and fret over so much. And Lord, we lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there is a card I want you to fill out. Uh, it's called our connection card, and if you're watching online or if you're here in the, in the building, if you'll find your mobile device and go either to hillcrest.church slash connect or that website that we're all more and more pointing people to, hillcrest.church slash bulletin. 
and then fill out the connection card there. If you're, uh, if you're a, a, a regular attendee or a member, just, just fill out your name and your email address, as we usually ask you to do. Uh, but if you're ready to take this step toward Jesus, or if you're ready to learn more about it or learn more about joining up with our church, then make sure to fill out some more of that connection card and then just hit the, hit the uh, send button and it'll come to us. And we'll just be glad to know that you are part of things with us today in the building or online. Uh, let's get our uh, worship band up here for our closing song as they come up. Just one more word of thanks for those of you who are so critical in making all of this work. And this is still a work in progress as we learn to be the church in the building and in our various houses. And that's going to be a reality with us for some time. Thank you so much for making that work. Let's close out in prayer.